part of the series of the Global Media Research Center. So thank you very much for, for joining us. Thank you, Daphne, for that wonderful introduction. Um, so I want to talk about this film, The Lives of Others. Uh, it won the Academy Award for Best Foreign Language Film. When I was in Germany uh, doing the Fulbright, um, there was a big argument about that film, which was in release, it hadn't yet won the Oscar, that no one was going to see. It made, uh, I think, $2 million in, uh, in Germany. Uh, and another film that I really liked a lot, uh, Der Schuh des Manitou, which is a comedy film, and it's the highest grossing film uh, ever in Germany. And uh, I want to preface my comments by saying um, I'm delighted to be here uh, at the Global Media Research Center, um, but I'm not an international film scholar by reputation or by inclination. Uh, I like to watch movies. Uh, and I don't really care where they come from. So sometimes this elicits argumentation by people who really care about national cinema, so I'm glad to engage in that. Uh, my talk today emerges out of an encounter I had with a theory text, uh, Friedrich Kittler's gramophone film typewriter, uh, which is written in Berlin uh, in the early 1980s at precisely the time the lives of others is set. Uh, and so I want to make an argument for the confluence between a theory text and a media text. And I want to do so for pedagogical reasons. Uh, I, I think one of the fundamental crises of film school uh, is that theorists come from the humanities uh, and want to talk about textual meaning. Uh, and most of the students in a film school want to make movies. Uh, and unless this is massaged right, very bad things happen. Uh, one of the things that happens is that the theory teachers get really frustrated that the students don't care what they're talking about. Uh, and the students write really nasty things on my student evaluations saying, I took all this bullshit theory and you're not helping me become a better filmmaker. Uh, so I offer this encounter, uh, admittedly a completely eclectic encounter. Um, I'm not a specialist in German cultural studies, nor would I want to be. Uh, and I'm certainly not a specialist in German cinema. Uh, now and again, I'll make some claims about the criticism of the lives of others, uh, which I've read. Uh, the summary uh, is that lots of critics are very upset with the lives of others because it is historically inaccurate which is, of course, a preposterous frame for reading a film. Um, one piece of criticism is interested in this portrait of the Stasi in the early 1980s, saying, oh, at the school where the Stasi are learning how to be uh, duplicitous spies, they would have worn uniforms. Like, <clears throat> this seems to me a very odd mechanism for driving criticism. And you'll notice that mine is not interested in that at all. But uh, this is the claim, uh, that by leading a reading of a film through a theory text, one can begin to close the gap that really threatens to rip uh, film schools apart. Um, OK, so uh, just to sort of summarize what Kittler is up to in uh, his gramophone film typewriter. He's interested in these three late 19th century technologies. Um, and he's interested in them because he believes they fundamentally transform the nature of uh, human experience in Western civilization. Uh, he's interested in the typewriter because it takes an articulation of uh, humanity, uh, handwriting is his example, and turns it into a machine-like generation. Uh, that is, if you or I type a typewriter button, it produces the same result. Uh, this becomes incredibly important to the lives of others in a sequence that I'll show you in a minute, uh, where the Stasi are after this playwright, the hero of the film. Uh, and the Stasi, in fact, know every typewriter in East Germany. So they have a catalog, and they have a guy whose job is to say, oh yeah, that radical owns this typewriter. He didn't write this subversive document. Uh, and of course, the trick that gets played on them uh, is that the hero playwright uh, smuggles 
his friends smuggle in a typewriter that the Stasi don't know about to write this angry missive against the East German government that gets published in Der Spiegel. So this is just one example of how one can push Hitler's book uh, into uh, an umbra over the lives of others. Uh, these three technologies, of course, are important to the 19th century uh, and are important to us as media scholars um, because they produce an encounter um, with what we study in media culture. So he's interested in the gramophone because it records the human voice. It turns out, as he studies, one of the fundamentally earliest uses of the gramophone was that loved ones would put the gramophone uh, in front of their dying loved ones to capture their voice. Uh, and then film, of course, we probably know. I don't have to belabor this. But uh, his claim in the book uh, is that these particular 19th century technologies are associated with militarism. Uh, one of his principal sources is Paul Virilio, um, and he's interested in the complicity between technology and warfare. Uh, and so he tracks the military history of all these things. The most interesting is the typewriter. The American typewriter in the 19th century was manufactured by the Remington Gun Company. Um, and in fact, as the Remington Gun Company collapsed financially, it was saved by the fact that it made typewriters. Um, and then he's very interested in um, how Edison worked as a, a telegrapher uh, in the late Civil War period. Uh, and he's interested in the effect that might have had on Edison as an inventor. Uh, in a communication college, I should probably make one brief mention that uh, we sort of have a collision between three forms of cultural studies. This kind of very strange Germanic form, which is highly theoretical, I'm about to talk about how Hitler is preposterously influenced by Derrida. Um, the North American strand, James Carey, of course, comes to mind here because Carey's work on the telegraph and its cultural consequences has a lot to do with Hitler's work here. Uh, and then, of course, the cultural studies that we know most, uh, the British, which uh, is not in play uh, in my work. Okay, so I'm really interested in making sure my students understand the importance of theory for doing this kind of work. Uh, so Kittler is primarily a post-structuralist influenced by Derrida. Um, that's odd because Germans generally aren't influenced by French critics, as I'm sure you know. Uh, and there's a remarkable moment in, early in the book that comes essentially from the postcard, if you know this Derrida book. Uh, Derrida's postcard um, begins with a study of this 14th century artwork that Derrida finds at the Bodleian Library at Oxford, uh, where Plato stands behind a seated Socrates, uh, and Derrida's postcard is driven by um, the bizarre encounter uh, that this postcard produces with history. Uh, Derrida is, of course, interested in deconstructing the history that we think we know about the transition from oral bardic culture to written culture uh, across the Odyssey. Uh, and what Derrida discovers in the postcard is that exactly the opposite of what we know to be true is represented in the postcard. That is, Socrates is supposed to be the guy that talks all the time, and Plato is supposed to be the guy who writes things down. So it's that reading that informs the kind of technological history that Kittler authors. Um, and I just want to read you a moment uh, from uh, very early in the book uh, when he's grappling with uh, this particular issue. Um, because what's of interest to the classical literary philosophy that uh, those folks care about the shift from oral culture to written culture for visual scholars like ourselves is what do we do with the cinema, right? In the Phaedrus, for example, the argument is between Socrates and the interlocutor, the platonic interlocutor. Um, and the argument is, oh, speech is better because you can change what you're saying as you look at your audience. And then the other position, the platonic position, is no, writing's better because you can edit and figure out exactly what you want to say before you say it. Uh, the cinema, of course, is a problem. It has something to do with speech. It's, for example, spoken. Um, but it has something to do uh, with writing. That is, you can't improvise a movie. You can't change it. Once it's on the celluloid, it's on the celluloid. OK, so this is what Kittler says. 
Um, since it has become possible to record the epics of the last Homeric bards, who until recently were wandering through Serbia and Croatia, um, oral cultures have become reconstructable in a completely different way. Uh, even Homer's rosy-fingered Eos changes from a goddess into a piece of chromium dioxide that was stored in the memory of the bard and could be combined with other pieces into whole epics. Primary orality is very influenced by Walter Ong, if I'm sort of communication people know more about this than me, and oral history came into existence only after the end of the writing monopoly um, as the technological shadows of the apparatuses that document them. So Kittler is proposing that these communication technologies of the 19th century bring about an end to the writing monopoly, which is very Derridean. That's what Derry does is. Okay, so I want to situate my encounter uh, with the lives of others, which is essentially a Kittlerian reading of that film uh, with this kind of Derridean reading um, of a different Greek film uh, by Theo Angelopoulos. Uh, this is, in fact, my favorite film adaptation. It's 55 seconds long. It's part of Lumiere and Company. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this film. They give the cinematograph uh, to a bunch of famous filmmakers to celebrate the 100 year of that device. Uh, and these 55 second minutes, uh, fi 55 second films result. Uh, and the last film in that collection is by Theo Angelopoulos, whose other film is sort of the inverse of this, a three hour Harvey Keitel film, which is also about the Odyssey. Ulysses gaze. Okay, but here's a one minute odyssey. So this is a film of historical triangulation that's coincident with the Derridian argument, um, oral culture, written culture, filmic culture, uh, that here we have 1995, the end of the 20th century, the end of the century of cinema, 1895, the invention of the cinematograph, the birth of the cinema, uh, and then Homer's The Odyssey, the prehistory of that shift from oral to literate culture. Um, so this is a film about the Odyssey, um, in which we only need to look at the turning point of the Odyssey, right? The moment when Odysseus stops all the traveling and comes home before he returns to seek Penelope. And what does Angelopoulos's uh, wanderer discover? He discovers the cinema, that what the film is about is the landing on the Greek shores and the gazing into the invention of the cinema. Okay, so it's that kind of work that I'm interested in. Ferreting out the images that subtend us and understanding what their theoretical content is. Um, this is a pretty aggressive argument and we can argue about it, but it assumes that the work of the cinema is coincident with the work of theory. Um, and that that's problematic in certain sectors, so we'll have to trace it out. But that is my belief. So. Uh, there are other ways of setting up how one might consider this reading of the lives of others. Um, here we come closest to what's at stake for me, a popular Hollywood film, a genre film like The Forgotten, um, is of the same status in my reading frame as The Lives of Others, this art cinema that wins the Academy Award. So here's a little passage through that so I can show you that moment. Kittler quotes Chris Marker's Sans Soleil. It is virtually the only film that shows up in the book. Uh, and Marker reflects in Sans Soleil, I wonder how humankind used to go about remembering 
Um, and Kittler, of course, has an answer. Uh, they used to put gramophones in front of dying people's mouths so that they could speak their last words and have it preserved. The notion of media and the preservation of the human is, of course, as important to us as it was to the 19th century. And in separate work that I've done, I'm really interested in the relationship between a play, David Lindsay Abair's Rabbit Hole, uh, and this science fiction film, Joseph Rubin's The Forgotten, because both of them feature the same historical scene. Um, a mother who's lost her son. In the case of The Forgotten, aliens have kidnapped the son. Uh, in the case of David Lindsay Abair, the son has been run over in a car accident. Uh, but in both cases, a historical mother has kept all the objects of the lost son, including a videotape. Uh, and in each of these plots, the videotape gets erased. The father accidentally erases it for a Discovery Channel show in Rabbit Hole. Uh, in this uh, film, the aliens have erased it because they're trying to trick the mom uh, into believing that her son never exist, existed. And of course, we know Hollywood logic. A mother love uh, is much more powerful than aliens. It's kind of truism. Write that down. OK, so in this scene early in the film, um, the mom's husband is not being helpful. In fact, the aliens have succeeded in erasing his memory. He doesn't believe that the son exists. So she goes to look for the videotape because all of the other objects, she has a scrapbook, all the other objects have been removed, and so she desperately goes to watch the videotape. It's a classic melodramatic formulation. It's a famous Grand Guignol play from the turn of the century called O Telephone. Uh, Griffith's Lonely Villa, if you know this film, is based on that play. Um, it's about um, the sanctimoniousness of modernity. So the husband goes off to work, and the wife's like, oh, I'm not sure. This is a bad neighborhood. Um, and he's like, don't worry. You'll be in contact with the telephone. Uh, and so he goes off to work, uh, and in the Grand Guignol play, um, the wife is, the house was attacked by tramps, um, and she calls the husband on the phone, and the husband is forced to listen to the tramps murder the wife with the telephone cord. Um, this is this kind of encounter with modernity um, that not only does the technology not protect you, uh, but it makes it worse. Uh, that is, in an age before the gramophone, uh, there would be no anticipation of the preservation of the dead object. Um, but in the age of videotape, we believe that we can preserve um, the child's memory. And then when he's no longer on the tape, it becomes a double, uh, a double assault. OK. So um, this leads me to this encounter with the lives of others. I just want to show you a couple clips, and then we can uh, chit chat about what's at stake here. OK. so. Hitler is interested in the way these various objects of media surveillance uh, ruin our humanity. They're invented and used for military purposes, and they're deployed in our lives, both our civilian lives and our militarized lives, in very damaging ways. Uh, it's a very pessimistic book. Uh, it has been critiqued by all kinds of people as being culturally determinist, because it believes if these media technologies are militarist, Therefore, we've been ruined by their militarization. Um, so it depends what you think about cultural determinism, about what you might think about Hitler. Um, the lives of others, um, for most of its narrative, seems to support the basic nature of Hitlerian pessimism. Uh, that is, the Stasi have all the power. 
uh, the playwright who's trying to resist the Stasi um, is being brutalized by their, their technological apparatus. Um, so the plot circles around these three devices. The Stasi have the playwright's apartment uh, video surveilled. Uh, they have it audio surveilled. The entire place is bugged. Uh, and then the key plot point revolves around this typewriter that's been smuggled into the country. Because the Stasi surveillance is not totalizing in a Foucauldian sense, they can't see into the apartment. They've got the outside video surveyed. They've got the inside audio surveyed. But when they go looking for the typewriter, they can't find it. Uh, and so the playwright has hidden the typewriter under the floorboards. Um, they search the apartment a couple times and can't find it. Uh, they finally coerce the playwright's wife, uh, girlfriend, uh, into revealing where the typewriter is. But in the meantime, the central Stasi agent, who becomes the hero of the film because he sympathizes with his victim, uh, steals the typewriter before uh, the Stasi guards can get there. So I want to show the opening of the film to think a little bit about how these images of this surveillance technology are deployed by the film. So before we know anything else, ooh, and let me show you one of the flaws in national technologies. So I have this elegant system where I rip clips and I can't play that for you because the subtitles are in the dead space in the image. The Germans have defeated QuickTime, which is not surprising, but true nonetheless. So the solution to that is to show you off the DVD. OK. All right. So this is this guy, Wiesler. He's the um, SS agent. And we don't know this yet, but he's doing an interrogation but the interrogation that we're seeing is in the past. He's, in fact, in the space of the classroom teaching the next generation of Stasi agents. The irony of the film is that generation of Stasi agents won't get to fly their craft because of the collapse of Soviet communism. Um, so there's a moment here where we shift from this space, which we think is the real, um, to the space of the recorder. He's recorded this interrogation, and he's using it as a teaching tool. Was haben Sie uns zu erzählen? Ich habe nichts getan. Ich weiß nichts. Sie haben nichts getan, wissen Sie. Sie glauben also, dass wir unbescholtene Bürger einfach so einsperren und zu einer Laune heraus? Eigentlich. Wenn Sie uns im humanistischen System so etwas zutrauen, dann hätten wir schon recht. unseres Staates sind arrogant. Merken Sie sich das. Wir müssen Geduld haben mit Ihnen. Etwa 40 Stunden Geduld. Ich hole Ihnen ein wenig vor. Ich möchte schlafen. Bitte lassen Sie mich schlafen. Die Hände oder die Schenkel. Schildern Sie mir noch einmal, wie Sie den 28. September verbracht haben. Bitte. Thank <laughs> you. 
unschuldiger Häftling wird mit jeder Stunde, die man ihn länger da behält, zorniger, wegen der Ungerechtigkeit, die ihm widerfährt, schreit und tobt. Ein Schuldiger wird mit den Stunden ruhiger und schweigt oder weint. Er weiß, dass er zu Recht dort sitzt. Wenn Sie wissen wollen, ob jemand schuldig ist oder unschuldig, gibt es kein besseres Mittel, als ihn zu befragen, bis er nicht mehr kann. Wir sind zusammen zu ihm nach Hause gegangen und haben Musik gehört bis in die späten Abendstunden. Er hat ein Telefon, Sie können ihn anrufen. Er wird das alles bestätigen. Fällt Ihnen etwas auf an seiner Aussage? Er sagt das gleiche wie am Anfang. Er sagt dasselbe wie am Anfang, Wort für Wort. Wer die Wahrheit sagt, kann beliebig umformulieren. Das auch. Ein Lügner hat sich genaue Sätze zurechtgelegt, auf die er bei großer Anspannung zurückfällt. 227 lügt. Wir haben zwei wichtige Indizien und können die Intensität erhöhen. Wenn Sie uns den Namen des Fluchthörers nicht nennen, muss ich noch heute Nacht Ihre Frau verhaften lassen. Ja, und Nadja kommen in eine staatliche Erziehungsanstalt. Wollen Sie das? für die Hunde. Sie ist bei jedem Gespräch mit Untersuchungshäftlingen abzunehmen und nie zu vergessen. Hm. Bei Verhören arbeiten Sie mit Feinden des Sozialismus. Vergessen Sie das nie. Guten Tag. Okay, so the project of this brand of theoretical film criticism um, is to produce a framework so we know what to look for in the image. The historicist criticism that's deployed against this film, the claim of looking into uh, whether the Stasi students are wearing uniforms or not, is one brand. What I'm offering is a different brand. And that is, Hitler says to understand Germany in the early 1980s, we need to understand the militarized deployment of these 19th century media technologies. Mm -hmm. Once you have that as armature, you go into the image and you begin to notice that the opening scene sequence of the film is designed around these basic Hitlerian principles. So for example, when the victim sits down and he keeps being told to put his hands on, on the chair, we have no idea what they're doing. Like, what is that? Um, and so it turns out to be a replication of Kittler's understanding of the typewriter. What happens? Beautiful, sensuous handwriting that has a human trace gets stripped away for this mechanical device. The Stasi invert the equation and take what is otherwise undetectable, a guy sat in a chair, and turn it into a trace. Individual humans can be traced by the scent of the dogs. Much of the film is built around this tension between the abstract, uncaring, technological. Everyone is being surveyed. No one has access to resources in East Germany, right? The joke about the telephone is always one in seven people had telephones in East Germany, and the joke is we never met the seventh person, right? No one had a telephone in East Germany. Okay, so I'm trying to offer a, an eclectic way of reading this film. Is this the only way to read the film? No. But it proposes that Whatever this crazy Hitler guy is up to, 
He's offering us some ideas that are at least challenging to what we might ordinarily think. That is, this particular kind of James Carey stayed understanding of the relationship between culture, technology, and media is really pushed to its brink point. There are moments when you read Derrida and Hitler and you're not quite sure if they ever had preserved their sanity. Um, and so I'm not doubting that there are critiques of Hitler. But my supposition is you have a problem with Hitler, take it up with him. That once it exists as an artifact, it can then be deployed against the film to make the film more interesting than it might have been before. Um, and you'll see why I might have some affinities with Derrida. That the moral relativism of which Derrida is accused could certainly be deployed against my reading of Franz as well. Okay. Um, let me just give you a couple more examples from this film, and then we'll chit chat about how this argument works. The one that's on the poster is the boss of Wiesler calls in a graphologist, a guy who specializes in typewritten fonts. So they're scanning Draymond's house, the playwright's house, looking uh, for the typewriter, and they can't find it. So they believe they have the totalizing control over every object in East Germany that they can, even if they can't produce the typewriter, they can still prove that he's guilty by saying, oh, he wrote it on his typewriter. He just comes to realize that his girlfriend has betrayed him. But Wiesler, the Stasi agent that begins the film, has stolen the typewriter. So Wiesler's boss gets chewed out by his boss because they can't figure out who published their Spiegel article. And so he summons the graphologist. Und wer hat so eine Schreibmaschine? So eine Maschine 
sie sind unsere Republik nirgends erfasst. Sondern das heißt, Frau Schachtel zum Beispiel, Hauser. Der Journalist Paul Hauser schreibt auf dem Modell Valentino des Aliletti-Betriebes. Bei diesem Modell wäre Einschlagswinkel wesentlich schon. Ja, 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 und Wahlen. Schreibt auf einer heimischen Optima-Elite. Georg Dreimann? Georg Dreimann schreibt seinen ersten Entwürfe per Hand und die Reinschrift dann auf einer Originalwand oder Torpede. Er hat noch nie irgendwas anderes geschrieben. Wie groß wäre denn diese Kodibri-Schreibmaschine? So, sie ist eine der kleinsten industriell hergestellten Maschinen. 19,5 cm mal 9 cm mal 19,5 cm. Also nicht schwerer zu schmuggeln als ein Buch. Danke, Sie können gehen. I'm firmly convinced I'd be that guy under totalitarian rule. Like, yeah, typewriters, they're 19 centimeters long, to have these things memorized. <laughs> uh, this is exactly what Hitler predicts. Um, he says that what the typewriter does is strip our humanity. We used to write in elegant handwriting, and now we're left to these machines. Um, the Stasi overcome even that limitation of modernity. They can identify as individuating all the typewriters in the country, thus returning the distinction between typewriters. Right? This is what's at stake, I think, in the movie. So Hitler throws up his hands and says, yep, there's modernity. It's turned us into so-called man. That's what he says. It's, a, it's an insult. We, we've lost our humanity. It's a cultural pessimism. Uh, this film, on the other hand, not so. A deeply humanist film that believes in the transformation of the Stasi agent. Many radicals in the humanities don't believe in that ending, and that's one of the reasons that this film has been so viciously critiqued. Um, it doesn't believe that a Stasi agent would transform into a hero. And so we can talk a little bit about my centrist humanism as opposed to a more radical stance that could be taken about the film. And then before I stop talking, I'll just show you one more moment. This is, in effect, the turning point of the film when Wiesler is on his surveillance, but is beginning to question the basic nature of the East German state. Uh, his underling, who's been doing the surveillance in his absence, has recorded with his typewriter every act of lovemaking uh, that Dreiman and uh, Christa Maria have engaged in. And the film elegantly deploys this in a Hitlerian sense. We see the flashback to the lovemaking, but on top of it is graphed the typewritten report. This is the moment in the movie that convinced me to write about it. Detailliert bricht Lazarus scheint hierüber unglücklich. Bei meiner Übernahme streiten Lasse und CMS darüber, ob CMS zu dem Treffen mit der Klassenkameradin Fragezeichen gehen soll. Schließlich geht sie. Lasse scheint hierüber unglücklich. Nach etwa 20 Minuten kehrt CMS aber schon zu Lasse zurück, zu seiner und meiner Überraschung. Er scheint hierüber sehr glücklich. Heftige Intimitäten folgen. Sie sagt, sie wird jetzt nie mehr weggehen. Er sagt wiederholte Male, jetzt werde ich die Kraft haben, ich werde etwas tun. Hiermit ist vermutlich gemeint, dass er ein neues Theaterstück schreiben wird. Die Stückeproduktion von Laszlo war nämlich über die letzten Wochen von Schwierigkeiten geplagt. Was sie mit ihren Äußerungen meint, ist unklar. Vielleicht, dass sie sich mehr um Laszlos Haushalt kümmern will als zuvor. Der Rest der Nacht verläuft friedlich. Okay, so... It's incredibly beautifully and ironic, right? Um, but it also, also Kittler in a nutshell. It is gramophone film typewriter. Part of the absurdity is the typewritten font over a most intimate human moment. Um, part of it is the use of voiceover. Everything that the guy says in his report is wrong. We know it to be wrong, because we know the context that he doesn't. Um, and this film attempts to intervene 
in German history in extremely productive humanist ways. Okay, thanks. <laughs>